Okay, good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the JBDC's virtual BizZone series. My name is Sansia Campbell and I'm from the Corporate Communications Unit and I have not been here in a long while. We've been engaged in doing some other things. Um, and so we've had a set of series of, of presentations. We've done some presentations on the Festival of the Cloth, where we invited the support of the Nigerian High Commission and fashion experts out of Nigeria, who are going to be helping us to support the local apparel, apparel industry in developing a local brand specific design. And then we also had the opportunity to share one of the newest opportunities for business growth with our Amazon 876 series. I don't know how many persons were able to join us for those presentations, but as a reminder, those presentations are available on the JBDC YouTube channel. And just to tell you a little bit about the Amazon 876, just, just the main highlight. The fact is that no Jamaican entrepreneurs can trade on that platform, meaning that you can sell using your local credentials. So if you are into e-commerce, if you want to go on and set up an account and all of that, it is something that can be done during, it can be done now. The, the platform has expanded to incorporate the local market. So that opportunity is also there for our local MSMEs. Now, in the last session that we had, the last virtual biz zone that we had, I think we did that on the 12th of August. It was about digital transformation. And this morning, we are going to be looking at another crucial area, which is cybersecurity for our MSMEs. And this morning, we have a very knowledgeable gentleman with us, and he's going to be presenting for us. He, he is a cybersecurity consultant and innovator. His name is Gavin Dennis. He is a Jamaican and he resides in Germany. And that's where he's joining us from this morning. So right here, we're in morning. He's in a completely different time zone. So we wanna extend our thanks to you, Gavin, for joining us at this point in your day. As is customary, we will take questions both during and after the presentation. Gavin will tell you how the questioning will go and so on. And I'm here to support. So if you drop a question in the chat, I will certainly ensure that Gavin gets that as well. So without further ado, it's over to you, Gavin. Thank you again for joining us this morning. All right, thank you, Sansia. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. So today I'll be be getting into, into some uh, cybersecurity matters, uh, which can help you in your, 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 your MSME, right? So I'll be sharing my presentation shortly. Uh, throughout the presentation, there will be uh, you know, a, a slide that you will see that says questions, and that's where you'll be able to throw out your questions for that specific section of the, the presentation. If there's something that really jumps out at you while I'm presenting, then you know, feel free to just drop a message in the chat so that we can pick it up in the question uh, segment. So. All right, everyone, so I'm now sharing. I assume you can, you can all see my screen. Yes, we're seeing it. All right, so uh, at the end of this session, you, you should be able to understand why cybersecurity is important for your business. You should understand how to implement basic cybersecurity, you know, as business people, and you should have a general understanding of how to maintain good cybersecurity habits. First off, security costs a lot less when it is not an afterthought. So be proactive. What this really means is that if you don't care about security before you have to deal with some type of security incident, such as being hacked it will cost you a lot more money if you're only thinking about security after you've been compromised, right? So it's important that you, you be proactive and you take some steps to protect yourself and your business before something goes wrong. Here's an overview of the areas that we'll be touching on. 
physical security, mobile, web, malware, social engineering, passwords, which everyone, I believe everyone has, compliance, privacy and data protection, social engineering, well, again, network security. Now, there are, are four key things to think about when you're, you're thinking of security controls. There are deterrent controls, preventive, detective, and corrective. So there are some, uh, some things that you can do which they help to prevent something bad from happening, uh, such as being hacked. Sometimes it helps to detect when something uh, bad is happening. Like if you have an anti-malware software, it pops up an alert and says, hey, you know, this file is suspicious, this file is a virus. And then you have the corrective stuff, which would include things like having backups. So let's say you are compromised, there are things that you can do to correct it. So, so any control or anything that you will do to help yourself and your business, they would fall within one of these uh, control types. Now, in terms of not being a, a victim, for cybersecurity, there are lots of different things to think about, right? But I'll try to break it down in very simple terms to help you understand. But this just gives you a general idea, especially if you're a technical person, some of the broad areas that you have to think about within your business that you need to protect. So one, you almost everyone has emails. Endpoint security covers like your laptop and if you have any servers in your business, and user training helps to ensure that you and your staff understand what they should and should not do to help protect um, the, the business and what they do in their daily job so that they don't contribute to a compromise. And so these are just some of the broad areas. After, afterwards, I'll be sharing the slide or the JBDC will be sharing the slide, uh, the slide deck with you. So you'll have, you'll have this entire deck to, to, to keep and to refer to at any point in the future. If you know all of the information that's being shared is just, uh, just not enough for you to remember every single thing, you will have this afterwards. Now let's talk about compliance. So there's the Jamaica Data Protection Act that was passed uh, in parliament, right? What that means is, is that this law is coming right? It's, it's not something that is still being debated. It is coming. There will be a two-year transition period, and then it will be in full effect. What this means for your business is that you will have a legal obligation of how you handle people's personal data. Now, the law speaks to a lot of different things, you know, the kind of rights that people have. So as you're operating your business, you might have the business need to collect certain pieces of info, people's name, email address, maybe their, their home address, maybe health information. It depends on the nature of your business. The purpose of this law is to ensure that businesses are not abusing people's data and they are, uh, you know, they are showing people respect and giving them certain, certain rights. Because of just how technologically advanced everything has become, data has been, become also a very critical part of people's lives. So for example, companies are getting hacked and people's, you know, people's personal medical history is being disclosed online. Now, over time, what has happened is that businesses have not given enough care and attention to, to the data that they collect from people, which directly can identify a person, right? So a lot of these laws have been popping up all around the world, things like GDPR, now there's a Jamaica Data Protection Act, and there are lots of Car uh, Caribbean countries that have started or have already implemented a data protection law, such as Trinidad, Barbados, uh, and a few others. So this is a law that you should become um, familiar with. We cannot touch on a lot of the, 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 the areas within the law, but what you need to know is that if you don't comply with the law, your business can be fined, right? And, and that fine, I believe, that fine can range from, uh, I believe it's uh, up to 4% of your company's um, annual income, right? So your business can be fined. So it's really important that you understand what is in this law. Now, there are non-mandatory non uh, compliance um, requirements that you, know, you might want to meet. So you might say that, hey, you know, although you're not legally required to comply with this cybersecurity framework or that data protection law or regulation, you might want your business to comply with it because you know that it's really just a good thing to do. So there are lots of cybersecurity stuff out there. 
And, you know, although there aren't any laws right now that force businesses to comply with them, if you choose a standard or some uh, cybersecurity framework and you say that, hey, you would like to, to at least try to make your business measure up to this law or be compliant with it, you can impose that yourself so that, you know, you, you, you know that you're doing the, the diligent thing, the diligent and the responsible thing to try and implement security before you are forced to. Here are some, some data protection and compliance solutions. Uh, eventually, I know that for a lot of the persons here, there are different types of, of business people here. There are people who have, you know, it's, it might be solopreneurs, you know, then there are persons who might be operating micro, small, medium enterprise. So as your business scales, you might find more and more um, reason to need to have some type of software solution to manage things. If you're really, really small, for some things you can manage those with Excel sheets and some other little um, software that isn't too um, heavy. But as you scale, these are just some of the pieces of software that you can look into. And you'll have the slide, as a reminder, you'll have this slide deck so that you can refer to this at some point in the future. Questions. So, Based on what I mentioned about the data protection law, do you have any concerns you know, on, uh, about how it affects you and your business? I'll also be looking yes. in the chat. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Um, so the sure. data protection law, um, Gavin, this is Sancio. The data yes. protection law, is it specific for businesses? How does it work? Yes. Is it a case where if a business collects my information as a customer, they have a responsibility to protect that information? So, so what I really want to know is what does the law really protect? So, so the law, the law itself, they have uh, eight standards, right? Uh, we won't get into all eight, but essentially they say that you know people have certain rights. So you have the right to request that your information is deleted, uh, that you know, your information is, is, is amended if you believe that it is correct, right? If there is a right. data breach, the, the business has, if there's a data oh. breach, the business has the, the responsibility to notify you of a data breach. So what's happening now is companies get hacked and then right. they cover it up and they, they because it's, it's bad publicity, it's, they can get sued and all of those things. So they cover it up but then people don't get a chance to, to protect themselves. So your data is stolen, it is dumped online somewhere. And because you didn't get a chance to protect yourself or to change your password because they hid it from you, then right. you know, people are being affected. So, so those are just some of the reasons why you have these data protection laws popping up. So they are very, very helpful for everyone here because you are all individual citizens of Jamaica, but at the same time you have a business. So you are being protected as an individual, but as a business person, you also have to protect the personal data that you are collecting about Jamaican citizens. Exactly. Right. Um, I think there has to be a way, though, to because I've been hearing about this data privacy act since last year, I believe it, 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 yes. it was. And what, what, we have to find a way to break down the information so that the regular person can so grasp there, it. Yes. So there is a guide. There is a guide that's available, and I'll, I'll share it. I'll share it uh, afterwards so that. Uh, it can be sent that, to everyone here. So there is helpful. a yes, there is a simple guide that's available. But but for everyone here, you should also take the time to read the the, the actual laws. So although the guide breaks down the law in a simple term, in simple terms, it's really important to read the actual law because that is what you will really be held accountable to. So okay. yes. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, does anyone else have any questions before we move on? Okay, so I guess uh, no, no questions so far. All right, so let's move on, all right? Let's look at physical security. So we all have you know, our devices, you know, our flash drives and all of that. Now, as a, as a business person, or at least what I find often with small businesses is that 
they sometimes believe that because they're not a, a large entity, that people don't care about their, their, their info, people don't care about trying to hack their business. And that's not true. Now, from the physical side of things, you have flash drives, you have you know, papers, business documents that you, you throw away in the garbage. Um, so these are some of the things that you have to think about. You know, no matter the, the size of your business, you all have the same things that the, the, the larger businesses have. It's just that you have it on a smaller scale. So you might have one flash drive, but a multinational company might have a thousand, but you still have a flash drive that has uh, information about your business that someone else finds useful. And it's also information that someone else can use against you. So example, let's say you sign up, you, you, you know, you're, pushing your, 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 your business, it's very new, you sign an NDA um, with a, a client, right? Now, because you, you haven't been, been seeing your business as a target, you dispose of some kind of paper that has confidential info on it in the garbage, you know, about your client or about you know, the, the, the nature of the business that you did. Now, that information gets out, someone finds it, decides to use it against you, maybe even try to, to blackmail you or just to, to, to cause trouble. Your client um, finds out, they now decide to sue because you've signed an NDA and because of your negligence or because of your mistake, that confidential info gets out. So the way how you handle your flash drives, you know, the things you dispose of in the garbage, things that you print um, for your business, you have to think about, are you securing these things so that they don't fall into the wrong hands, so that they don't get disclosed uh, to, to someone you know, that it shouldn't? And also, if you have a physical building for your business, it's also important to check if people are following you into, into sensitive areas, right? So these are things that, that what's called um, part of social engineering. So instead of people trying to break into your business or to, to break into an area where you have sensitive info, they just try to wait until someone is going there and simply follow along. So physical security is very, very essential as much as the the, the, the digital side of things, because for everything in cybersecurity, we're talking about um, you know, data and things on phones, on laptops, but they are still on a physical device and you have to protect them. Your flash drive is still, the data on your flash drive still is being held on a physical device. So it's also important to think about. Do you have any questions? Or at least what, what questions do you have? I'm seeing a message in the chat from, from uh, Tanya Batson Savage. Any recommendations for non-mandatory element standards? So yes, so I'll, I'll, I'll type um, uh, some standards in the chat now, but there are a few cybersecurity frameworks, standards that you can, you can implement in your business. So there's one called, the, called ISO 27000, and that's an information security standard. So I've posted that in the chat. There's NIST CSF, which is more for larger companies, but you can apply it to your small business, right? Because the requirements are still very similar. It's just that you wouldn't have to go through so much work to, to complete implementing it. There's NIST CSF. You have CIS, uh, critical controls. All right, so these are three, and I'll leave them at three for now, but these are some that you can implement in your business. So Gavin, are you saying that these could be um, used in the real, real micro businesses? Because as you said, uh, we'll have a lot of solopreneurs and micro entrepreneurs in here. So we want to ensure that, you know, they, they can be adapted. So, so I've, I've just posted it. So CIS critical controls okay. is ideal. Uh, okay, that great. you know that you can uh, use in your small business because it talk, it gets into the it gets into the little technical details of what you can do to to protect yourself on a technical level. So so you know protecting your flash drives, um, you know, scanning your systems. You know you might even have to refer to someone who is um, a little bit uh, who is savvy with technology if you are not, right? But they are things that you can implement, and and on a smaller scale. So. You know, that's a good thing. You don't have to implement it on a large scale like a, a big business. Okay, so wonderful. Yes, yeah, so I see one more question before we move on yes, uh, from Donovan McLaren. Uh, says, when a tech person fixes your system remotely, 
how can one check that he has removed uh, that he has removed removed themselves fully, right? So you know that's a that's a good question. We might have to come back to it. Uh, we might have to come back to it because it really depends on on um, on what they 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 were supposed to do to fix the problem. What I often suggest is that you, whenever you give someone your system, it's not something that you leave with them, right? And also, if you have to leave your PCs with them or your, your phone, that you remove all of your data from it. So you don't give them with all of your data on it, right? If you have to, such as, let's say, it's, it's a case where your, your screen was damaged, so it's, you don't have that functional option of going in, copying your data, et cetera, then I recommend that you stay there and, and watch them as they fix it, right? So, so that's my suggestion because some, some of the, the people who repair devices right around the world, some of them are shady and they will copy things from your PC or your mobile device when you're not around. So don't leave any of your personal data on those devices. Password security. Now, we all have lots of online accounts. It's really important to set a strong password, right? Additionally, get a password manager. There are a few password managers out there. So let me, let me pull up uh, on the screen. So after this, you can simply Google password manager, right? And you'll see a few options. This is really a central piece of software that stores all of your passwords. What it does in, in reality is it takes away all of that mental stress of you trying to remember multiple passwords. And it allows you to, to set strong passwords uh, easily because all of that is handled inside the password manager. You can tell it, generate a password of 16 characters and you store it inside there. So you don't have to remember what is that long password to get into account A versus account B versus account C and that helps to keep your account safe. What, what happens now for a lot of persons is that they, are, they set one password that they can remember and then they use it on multiple accounts. But the problem with that is when one account gets hacked, based on how the, the cyber world is, is operating, when one account gets hacked, the hackers take that email address or that username and password combination and they go to multiple other websites to see if you're using that same combination there. So now, persons have one account that's compromised that eventually leads to multiple of their other accounts being compromised, such as their email, their email, their internet banking, uh, their Amazon accounts, you know, just lots of, of additional things, their PayPal and, and other things because they're using the same passwords in all of, in multiple places. So set a strong password, use a password manager so that it's not so mentally taxing for you to try and remember multiple passwords. Any questions? Questions, anyone? I'm looking in the chat. Was there a specific um, password manager that you recommended or you must just Google search it? Uh, you can Google search there, you, you can't lose. For, for the password managers that are there, no. If you Google for, let's say, top five password managers, any one of them that you choose, um, they will be good, right? The only difference is, is whether or not you will upgrade to a paid version of that password manager based on your demands. So some of them offer a free tier, you can store up to 50 passwords for free and things like that. So it all depends on you know, what type of demand you have and if you want to upgrade, but you will end up with a, a good password manager that does um, fix the, the, the issue of, of maintaining your passwords in a solid place. Okay, great. Thank you. So what I want to show, show you all now before we jump back into the slides is just a, a quick search of you know, the keywords cyber, hack, and Jamaica, right? So you can understand what's happening out there. Now, when you go through these results, you're seeing just a few companies, right? But I work within the industry and there are a lot of companies right across the Caribbean, Jamaica and the Caribbean, who they are being hacked, but it doesn't make it into the news for different reasons, right? Now here you're looking and you're seeing that there was a local bank that was hit and you see how 
there are multiple headlines relating to that single entity. Now, for you as a small business owner, micro, you know, MSME, if your business gets hacked, it might not make it into the news, right? But the effect that you will have to deal with from being hacked can shut down your business completely. Now, with large entities, what happens is that when they get hacked, they, they often have a lot of um, financial resources to eventually bounce back, right? And with a, a bank or, or a financial institution, they have lots of reserves and other businesses that they can go to and get really large loans to help them deal with that. But as a small business, it can be the difference between your business being completely shut down or, or, or draining your financial resources to try and recover. Here's one example that happened recently. Someone was hit uh, with something called ransomware, which is a form of malware. When it gets onto your computer, it, it encrypts your files. And then it leaves a note that says, if you want, uh, if you want to regain access to your, to your files, you have to pay money. Now, the amount of money that they often ask for is usually a lot. You're, you're thinking of things from 5,000 US up to, I think the largest amount ever demanded was, I think, 70 million US. Now, even for the, 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 the prices on the very tiny, tiny side of things, 5,000 US, that's almost 1 million Jamaican. And if all of the files, just think about your PC now, if all of the files on your work laptop now, your work PC, gets encrypted and you cannot access them at all. None of your Excel sheets, none of your, your Word documents, none of the pictures of you and your family or pictures that are relating to your business. If you cannot access any of those things right now, what would you do, right? What a lot of businesses have to do is start from scratch or if they have a backup, they restore those files from a backup. But when you are an, uh, an SME, sometimes you don't have all of those things well organized. So the best thing to do is to protect your system from being compromised in the first place, all right? So just uh, think about that for uh, a bit. Now let's talk about mobile security. Uh, coming back to the smartphones, because it is such a big deal, it is such a big deal where we rely heavily on our smartphone. We almost go nowhere without, right? And I can tell you that I, I, I go everywhere with my phone because that's how people reach me. That's how I read my emails and all of that when I'm not by my PC. But we also need to protect our smartphones. So first off, if your phone has the functionality to encrypt the data on your phone, use it. Set up a remote wipe function so that if you lose your device, you can log into an account online like Google. So if you have a Google account on your phone, you, you very likely have the option to remotely wipe your phone. So if you, if you lose your phone, you can simply log in online. You can try to track your device's location, or you can send a signal to the phone to say, wipe all of the data. And that will help to keep, keep whatever sensitive data you have on your phone private. Second, auto lock your device. Add a password, a fingerprint, a swipe code, add that to your phone and ensure that it automatically locks after a certain time. Sometimes you might be using your phone, you put it down, you know, someone nearby sees your phone, picks it up and is looking for an opportunity to snoop through your phone and steal something. But when your phone uh, has an auto lock uh, set on it, really a screen timeout and a password or some other mechanism to keep people out, that helps to protect you. So ensure that your smartphone is protected. Thirdly, minimize harmful apps. For many of you, you likely use your, your you likely use a single phone for both work and business. So the, the apps that you put on your phone, although you might be using them for personal purposes and, and you know and they are just for, for leisure, they can also affect you from the business side. They can steal your data if they are very shady and if they are apps that, that are known to be malware. So it's, it's, really, it's really important to think about this app that I'm putting on my phone, is it legitimate? You know, have I you know, do a basic Google search to say, 
have has anyone reported that this app is malware or it's unsafe and one of the key things that you can use to to identify the, the apps that are shady is that they have a lot of ads that's usually that's usually one of the signs apps with a lot of ads tend to be very very shady additionally if you're just browsing the internet and you're getting these weird pop-ups that hey you should download this app you should your phone has malware, you should download this to protect it. Those are also very shady apps. And this oftentimes steal your pictures. They, they, they sometimes create what's called uh, backdoors into your phone where people then steal your messages and your call logs and, and those type of things. So minimize the amount of apps that you use on your phone, especially for just personal purposes. All, you know, some of the games are also very dangerous. Some are safe, but try to minimize them. Gavin, may I, may I come in here and just ask a question, please? Sure. So, for example, you are on your laptop. You have a, a protective thing. Um, you know what I'm talking like, Avast or one of yes, those things? Yes, yes, yes. Right. But that same app keeps telling you that or oh, you have may you may have been exposed your location is exposed your banking information is exposed how do you deal with that so so avast so avast specifically is one of those one of those mobile apps where they try to they try to scare you into buying something right wow. but there are but there are several other mobile security vendors where they might offer a free version of their mobile app, their mobile antivirus, and then yeah. have to pay to get the premium version that doesn't have any ads at all. But for Avast, the ads are usually around, around security of your phone, while for the other apps that are really shady, they often have ads for just lots of unrelated things to the app. So it might be a, a, a game but you're getting ads for all sorts of products and different stuff online and things that it wants you to download, which have nothing to do with the purpose of the app that you're using. But Avast, uh, you know, I've, I've tried Avast in the past and that's one of the things that I, I didn't like. They, they were constantly trying to, 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 to scare you to say, hey, you should buy this, buy this from us, buy this from us, you've probably been hacked. In. So, so Avast is what is, isn't such a great example, even though they are, in the security business. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. All right, thank you. Sure. All right, so uh, moving on for mobile security, here are some of the solutions that, that you can eventually look into for your business. As your business starts to grow, you will have to, you'll eventually um, find these more useful. You know, so IBM Mass 360, Manage Engine, if your company, or your business is offering mobile phones to staff, you can use software called MDM, uh, Mobile Device Management, that helps to control what the devices can do. So you can use this to, to, to require that everyone sets a password. You can use this to control which apps are on people's phones. So that helps to, to, to control you know, the, the, the security of the mobile devices that are being used with your business information on them. Do you have any, any questions? So Sansia just asked, but does anyone else? Ah, Tanya, go ahead. I have to unmute Tanya. Good morning. Um, I'm not sure this Hi, is a Tanya. section for it, but based on what you presented, it presented the question in my head, so I'm asking it. If you'll answer later, my apologies. Um, sometimes you're surfing, and it says you get a warning that says like this website is unsecure or it's unsafe mm. etc usually because i'm a big wuss i back up which it tells me do you want to revert to whatever so i don't eat some and sometimes it's some local government sites too and i've seen it says this is unsecure and i'm like all right i'm not going on you on my phone I'm not going on you on my tablet because my phone is a skittle. My tablet is not. <laughs> my phone goes on any site. Um, yeah. Is that something to be concerned about or is it just um, 
Safari or Google being overprotected? Uh, so it's it's something to be a little bit concerned about. So so generally, what happens is that you have different types of warnings that will pop up. So if a website is not using what's called HTTPS, so when you visit a when you visit a site, let me show you right now. So when you visit a site, if you click in here, you see this little HTTPS that comes before the the website address. If it does not use HTTPS, then the browsers give a, a little warning, a little icon you know that says hey this site is the connection is not secure um, that is one form of of warning that's displayed now there's another warning that would take over the entire browser here that says are you sure you want to continue to this site and that is when there's a, a, a bigger security issue that's happening sometimes if the if google or firefox or whoever if they know that that site is known for malware or phishing or things like that, sometimes those warnings will be there. But in general, when you see those warnings, it's, it is usually an indication that it's not, a, it's not a good site to visit. So the best thing would be to not visit them, right? Because there's, there's I, I believe the cost might outweigh the benefit of what you would get from visiting those sites. And it's unfortunate that, that some of those sites are, are also government sites, you know, from your experience, but but it's in most cases when those warnings are there, it's usually best to not proceed because they're, the browsers have lots of intelligence that they are, are using uh, behind the scenes to determine if this domain is safe or not. So it's best to just not visit. I see, uh, Tanya, does that, does that un answer your, your question? I'm not sure. Uh, Don Donovan, Donovan McLaren has. Uh, sure, sure, Donovan, go ahead. Tanya said you answered her question. Okay, perfect. All right, Donovan, go ahead. Donovan, just unmute your mic, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Is Avas safe, irrespective of the ads? Otherwise, yes. is it safe? Yes. Yes, it is. It is. And, and I, use, I use the PC version um, of Avast on one of my machines. So it is safe. It's just that for their mobile apps, it's, 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 uh, it's filled with ads, right? But what happens with a lot of these is when you upgrade to their premium version, then you don't have to deal with any of these ads. So it's, it's like the cost of getting something for free. You know, using the free version, you don't have all of the, the benefits. The, the, the real benefits and they kind of annoy you with ads to say, hey, you know, upgrade from free. So, so that's the, the thing. But in general, yes, it's a very respectable company. They're doing good and I trust them because I also use the premium version of their, their PC um, antivirus for one of my machines. Okay, Gavin, you can go ahead now. All right, so let's get into uh, web-based threats. Uh, we have about 15, uh, minutes left in the session. So web-based threats. We, we just talked a bit about, you know, shady websites, um, you know, the little warnings that will pop up in your browser. And although you're not a technical person, the key thing for you to, 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 to keep in your head is do not ignore the, the warnings or the red flags. All right. So although you don't know exactly why Google is showing this warning for this website, uh, just understand that there is a, a, a good reason behind it. And so you should be skeptical about whether you need to actually proceed to that site. So shady websites, they often are filled with ads, right? It's, it's often one of the, the, the common things. They're filled with ads and they also are filled with pop-ups. So whenever you visit, just lots of different pop-ups pop are coming, you know, they're opening other websites in your browser. Um, you know, the slightest of things that you click on, it, it just generates a lot of pop-ups. Those are usually some of the red flags. Um, be skeptical about what you share, right? So now what happens is there's a lot of disinformation happening and also people share malware and dangerous things in WhatsApp and such. So one of the common things, one of the common things that happened recently is people getting WhatsApp messages that the government is giving out Corona um, payments, like payments to, for people who have taken the, the vaccine and those type of things. So scam related stuff. Some of them are trying to steal your personal info. So when you click on some of those links, they say, okay, 
you know, we have your 100,000 ready. So all you have to do now is enter your name, your passport, um, your, your ID numbers and things like that. You know, your date of birth and they collect all of that and then use that to either, to either scam you or steal money from your accounts. So be skeptical about what you share. Look at the links. Does this link look like it's from the government? Does this link look like it's from the actual business? You know, when you get a, a, an email and you're not sure if this, if, if this domain, this URL that's in the email actually is from the, the, the authentic source, you can just do an independent Google search after, right? And that will often show you that, oh, this isn't really from that um, agency or from that company because the, the, the link that's in the WhatsApp message says, ABC claim your money now, while the actual agency's domain is, is, is Y, right? So be skeptical about what you share and what you accept, you know, especially in instant messaging and social media. Thirdly is automate your protection. So for me, I don't worry too much about a lot of the sites that I visit. Why? Because I use software that automates that for me. So for me, I, I told you about Avast earlier, right? So when I'm on um, uh, my other machine that has that Avast premium, if I visit a website and that website is known to be um, shady or the website actually has some kind of content on it that's malware, Avast will automatically block it. If I'm downloading a file and that file contains um, some type of malware, Avast will block it and generate an alert. So I don't have to be stressing too much to think, oh, is this file really dangerous? Because Avast is automatically scanning every single file, every single website that I use, every connection. So that is just automatic. So all of that mental load comes off and I don't have to be so um, scared um, when I'm online. And that's what I also recommend for you. So automate them. You can use pop-up blockers in your browser. You can have scanners like anti-malware, you know, anti, antivirus scanners. So do you do use these, um, these types of, of software and in most cases, the premium version so that they can do all, all of that, that work for you and you don't have to be stressing out trying to become a cybersecurity expert, you know? Here are some of the software that you can use. Um, you know, Avast is something that you can also add to this list, but here you're looking at Bitdefender, you're looking at Titan HQ, you're looking at Webroot, and these are things that you can use in your business. So if you have, if you're, you're not only a single person, whether you're a single person or you have multiple persons in your business, it's important that all of your machines, all of the, the systems that your business is using, that they are protected with some kind of anti-malware software and the premium versions of these, because the free versions are usually not very good for any, any of the things which are really worthwhile for your business. Oftentimes the free versions have very limited functionality. Any, any questions? Any questions, anyone? Questions around anti-malware? Ah, so I see a message from Tanya. So Tanya is asking, will this session cover hacking of Zoom meetings? So, so I can touch on it. I can touch on it uh, right now until any other question pops up. So uh, the, the, the whole Zoom hacking thing, um, when it initially came up, I think last year, Zoom, Zoom has implemented a lot of things to fix that, right? The problem that still happens is that, is that the way how people set up their Zoom meetings, it sometimes allows for this Zoom, this Zoom bombing. It's not really that it was that their, your Zoom account was hacked, but sometimes people who are unwanted ends up in your Zoom meeting and they end up you know, speaking and saying things that you don't want them to see. And they are really just there trying to be a nuisance. Now, there are some things that you can do, um, some things that you can do, and there are some things that it's really difficult to avoid. So let's say you're planning to have um, a, a, a session that will be hosted on Zoom and you share that with the general public. That has a lot of risk with it because that means anyone can join your Zoom session. And when anyone can join your Zoom session, they know the link and when they join, 
anyone in your session can speak, then there is that natural risk that someone will speak who is just there trying to be a troll or just there trying to disrupt your session. When you have, when you have online sessions, not just Zoom, but any platform, when you have online sessions which are for a private group of people, then there is a greater trust because you know that everyone who is in this session are um, legitimate people, people that you know and people that are, are not here to cause problems. So, so it, really, it really comes down to, to whether, whether, whether your Zoom session is just open for anyone and they can all unmute and speak, or if it's for a private group of people that you trust. Right. But a lot of things, a lot of a lot of security improvements have been added to Zoom since that whole Zoom bombing thing um, kicked up last year. So it's not so it's not so big of an issue now. But the primary thing is who is in the session, because it's not a case that you know your session is hacked per se. It's just that someone is just being a nuisance. All right, Gavin. There's a whole slew of questions in here. Yes. So uh, I'm wondering if I should just uh, answer them at the end. We have yeah, we have answer, the, the one from Tara. The ones from Tara yes. answer those at the end. But I think the one from Shanika is important for right okay. this minute. So okay. disadvantages, so yeah. So Shanika is asking, what are the disadvantages of, the disadvantages of signing into another website through example, using Facebook to log into Instagram or Google for multiple websites. So, so this is good, right? Um, good question. And also it is not a bad thing. So what is happening now is that Google, a lot of these tech companies, Google, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, they have such a large customer base that it is now possible for other websites to to rely on those third-party tech companies to identify the person that is logging into their website. So let's say I have a website. Instead of me asking you to come to my website and create a username and password, I can simply add this functionality, add a functionality to my website that says, log in with your Facebook account, log in with your, your, um, your, your LinkedIn account and such. And what it does is, is that, I, my software or my website um, connects, is integrated with Facebook and, and Facebook essentially logs you in and says, hey, this, is, uh, this person that's logging in is Shanika, but they don't actually share your password with that third party site. So it is safe. It uses a technology called OAuth. Um, don't really have to get into the technicalities, but you don't have anything to worry about as long as when you use those options, you don't provide a password because it shouldn't ask you to provide a password um, if you are already logged into Facebook or whichever else. It is safe and it's becoming a wider practice now. So, so yes, nothing to worry about. All right, so let's uh, move on and we'll come back to these. So malware and social engineering, uh, we touched on the, the the, the topics of malware. We talked about, you know, um, how you can minimize some of the malicious software, not installing too much fluff on your devices and even on your PC, right? Types of social engineering, people will try to trick you. So social engineering is the, is the, 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 the practice of trying to trick someone into taking an action or sharing uh, sensitive info. So people, there are different types of social engineering. You have what's called phishing, where you get emails that are trying to either get you to open malware or send something, people trying to tell you that they are, you know, a Nigerian prince and you should send your, your, your passport and you should make a payment. You will have vision where people will call you and say, hey, I'm calling from this, this, this company, this utility company. We notice that there's an issue on your bill. Can you confirm your identity by telling us your date of birth, your passport number, your, your mother's maiden name? They will often try to get things from you that they can then take and go to your bank or go to banks and then try to, to, to verify that they are you. So always be skeptical. Always try to confirm where people are calling from. And remember again, do not ignore the red flags. You know, it's, 
it's often one of the things that that sinks a lot of people when they when they realize that they've been scammed they think they think back and they say you know that i thought that i i was thinking that you know something didn't seem right but they decided to ignore it and just proceed so try to protect yourself from social engineering people who are trying to trick you into either doing something that might be harmful to you or sharing some type of sensitive info. And it all really comes down to being skeptical. So try to be professional skeptical, professionally skeptical. So even when you believe that something is suspicious, you know, there's no, you don't have to, to get angry. You can simply say, hey, you know, I'm not willing to share this info, you know, you know, no thank you, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you move on with your day. Because there are some very weird cases where businesses have bad practices in how they, they, they request info from customers and it can seem very suspicious or fraudulent and you don't want to be rude to a legitimate request that was just poorly worded. So always try to be professionally skeptical. And these are some email security things that can protect against those nasty emails that you might get. These are some endpoint security tools that can protect your, your, your PCs from all of these different types of malware that's popping up online. Social engineering, we touched on that earlier in terms of the calls, the SMS, you know, people, conversations in public places is something that people fall victim to often. Shoulder surfing. So sometimes people will simply, when you're, if you work in a, a co-works, co-working space, Sometimes people will just stand nearby and look when you're typing in your passwords and then they will just go on their PCs and, and type it in, right? So shoulder surfing is just really standing by someone's shoulder, looking over their shoulder, looking at what they're typing, looking at what's on their screen and then taking that info and going to do um, you know, something malicious with it. Network security, uh, protect your business devices train your people. So ensure that everyone within your team and your company understands what they should and should not do and what type of habits they should, they should develop to help protect your, your company. So all of these things about um, knowing what, what are some of the red flags for websites, being skeptical about you know, emails that you receive from strangers, watching what you put on your mobile devices, all of these things are things that not only you should know as someone who is, who is a leader in your business, but everyone who is supporting you, you know, admin assistance, marketing, finance, everyone needs to have uh, this kind of knowledge so that they don't end up uh, making a mistake and, and sending out a transfer of money because the person called and said that you said, or because someone sent an email that looked like your email address to try and trick them into transferring money from your company. These are real things that happen, right? It's not, it's not hypothetical. These are real things that happen. People do get tricked. And in most cases, it's because these people are not trained to identify the, the, these, these situations that are, that are suspicious and what they should do, even if they are suspicious. Now, we're, we're right at the end uh, with, with four minutes to the hour. Now, for all of the things that we've discussed, right, and I'll get to the question that were posted in the chat, for all of the things that we've discussed, you might not believe or feel that you have the technical ca capacity to implement them in your business. And that's why you have companies like G5 Cybersecurity that can help. Additionally, if you have people in your own circle, you have a friend who works in IT, you have a friend that is a techie, you can always bounce your questions and ideas off them so that they can give you some advice. You might not know which anti-malware um, to, to install on your PC. They often have one that they like, one that they've tested, things they're familiar with. So they can often give you good referrals, but it's important to get help. Don't believe that that you need to be a cybersecurity professional to, and, and to, to have all of the knowledge yourself to properly protect yourself. If you don't have all of that knowledge, find someone else who does. In the same way how you're not a mechanic, you're, you're not a, a good plumber, you know, you're not an electrician, so you work with the professionals who do that, or you just ask someone to give you guidance who you know has that kind of professional knowledge. So do your own research, 
um, you know, check with people who already have that knowledge, who are more experienced. And additionally, we are also here, G5 Cybersecurity, to assist you. Right now, I'm in Germany, uh, right? But G5 is a US-based company and they can assist um, with your business because they support uh, businesses remotely. So it's, it's, there, there are no borders. So although we're not physically in Jamaica, G5 uh, cybersecurity can assist you. Now, so, so, yeah, you can go back to questions. the question yes. for Tara. Yes. yes, so to answer the questions, I saw, I think I answered Shanika's question. I see Tanya, ah, I answered Tanya's question. Tara, all right, so Tara Edmond has a question. For, for someone who's interested in going into cybersecurity, what is the first step I should take? Uh, first step, Tanya, uh, Tara, is to start small, right? So. So do uh, some basic research on what are you know, entry-level qualifications, uh, entry-level roles, and from there, simply start small. Don't worry about all of the fancy things that you see. Just start small, build a foundation, get the most basic certifications that you can get, and you build from there. As you start to study um, within uh, uh, for your first entry-level qualification, you will eventually develop knowledge that you can use to, to extend and to grow. Uh, what programming language should I start with? You don't need any programming language to start. And that's one of the really good things. You don't need to, to be, I, I don't like programming. I, I do a little bit of coding, but I don't like programming. I'm not building um, apps and that type of thing. So don't worry about programming for cybersecurity. You don't need to know a programming language. It helps, but you don't need to. Now, where can I get some practice on ethical hacking? So it's, a, it's a, a really a Google search away. But remember that cybersecurity is a lot more than ethical hacking. It's ethical hacking is hot in the news, right? So people tend to just jump to that as the, the default thing when they think about cybersecurity, but it's, the industry is very, very wide. Ethical hacking is really just a tiny piece of the overall um, cybersecurity. Why it is so hot is that when businesses get hacked, it makes the news, but there are lots of other things that are happening in security and lots of other things that, you know, it's not so hot in the news because it's not bad, you know, and you know that the bad news often gets, gets the most attention while the good stuff kind of just gets, yeah, we expect you to do that because you know, that's good. Um, where can I get internship to start learning in Jamaica? It's, it's very tricky because not a lot of companies are creating rules. So even though every business needs to have either their own cybersecurity team or someone external who is supporting them. A lot of businesses still haven't taken the, the step to, to create those roles internally for the ones that do need to have it themselves. And because of that, it makes it a bit, it makes it difficult for, for you to find internships roles and even just general job openings. You know, and I speak with a lot of people in Jamaica and have a, a community of people right across the Caribbean. And it's a, it's a general problem. Businesses know that they need large businesses, medium to large businesses. They know that they need to hire people for cybersecurity, but they just have not created the rules. I believe that answers all of Tara's question. I, I don't think we might get to everyone, but let me, let me try. Yeah, uh, there is just on. one last, oh, I saw a last one, don't, but go ahead with the Pope Tan. Uh, okay, so I'm seeing Hope Tan. Uh, he's an IT professional. Okay. Ah, so for Hope Tan is a, it's a direct message. So I think we'll I'll have to 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 discuss with Hope Tan afterwards. So Hope Tan, you can um, send me an email afterwards because uh, I think his question isn't for the public. Um, I see Shanika Wallace. What are the disadvantages? Okay, you answered that. Uh, let's see. And then the last one is from Arlene Henry Dawkins. Arlene, okay. So yeah. Arlene Henry is, what should be done? What should be done? I'm thinking that if that is, you think, if, yeah. Yeah, if you think your email may be redirected before it is received or sent. Okay, so if you believe that your email is being redirected, you should check if there if there is a forwarding that is set up on your account, right? So. Within your email settings, I don't know which email provider you're using, but you can Google for 
um, how to forward emails from for X accounts, let's say for Gmail or for Yahoo. And that will give you a guide as to where in your email account you should go to check if your email is being forwarded. So sometimes this is something that does happen to people when their email gets compromised. Instead of them taking over your account, they simply create a forward for your email so that they get a copy and, and you don't really realize that something's off. Right, because you're still sending and receiving emails like normal, but a copy is being forwarded to another email address. So this is something that you have to go into the settings of your account to check if your email is actually being forwarded to someone else. But it will vary depending on whether you have Yahoo, Gmail, a Microsoft account, or some other provider. So do a Google search for how to forward emails for X account, and X being whatever email provider you're using now. All so, right, great, thank you. Yeah, so I'll stop sharing now. So, so you know, thank you everyone. These are just some of the services that G5 Cybersecurity offers. Uh, we can help to protect your business against cyber attacks and data privacy breaches. So feel free to get in touch or just visit our website at g5cybersecurity.com. You will have this slide deck. Um, it will be shared with you. So you will always have this to refer to. And thank you everyone for participating. Thank you so much, um, Gavin, for joining us this morning. I can't believe that a, a session on cybersecurity can be so interesting. I was really, I was, my attention was kept for the, the hour that you, you spoke. So it was very good for you to join us this morning. And I'm sure the persons that joined as well found the information quite useful. So we want to thank you on behalf of Team JBDC for joining us. David, when it's part two, I'll let you know. <laughs> but um, we want to thank you again, um, Gavin, for joining us. I know that it is quite late where you are, but it's so great that you can take the time to share your knowledge with us, especially in this time. It's information that is very much needed because we need to know what we can do both as individuals and businesses to protect our own self in this now very digital world that we are living in. Just a reminder for everyone that the presentation will be available on the JBDC YouTube channel. So you can look out for that by the end of the week. If you know anybody that wanted to um, be here but could not be here for whatever reason or you weren't able to rejoin because we changed the time. We apologize for that again, but um, you will be able to view it on YouTube. We come back week after next Thursday with another interesting topic for you. You will get that information in your email very shortly as to what we're going to be dealing with. But thank you again for joining us, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again, Gavin.